will be introductory remarks and uh, opening remarks by In Askew, Director of the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research Department, including special program for research development and research training in human reproduction, HRP, World Health Organization, based as a headquarter based in Geneva. In the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed, Igor. And on behalf of WHO and the HRP Special Research Program, I'd like to welcome everyone to the launch of the sixth edition of the laboratory, WHO Laboratory Manual for the Examination and Processing of Human Semen. I'd like to start by saying that WHO strongly endorses the human right of everyone everywhere to have the highest standard of health, including their sexual and reproductive health. All member states around the world have committed to the Sustainable Development Goal for Health, and included within this commitment is SDG 3.7, Universal Access to Sexual and Reproductive Health Services. Universal access must include the laboratory tests and analyses needed to ensure that everyone can easily access high quality diagnostic and therapeutic services without incurring financial hardship, to avoid the adverse health and socioeconomic consequences of sexual and reproductive ill health. For WHO, the right to the highest standard of reproductive health includes that individuals and couples be able to have the number of children desired and when desired. Achieving this right means being able to access contraceptive services and fertility care services as and when needed. For the past 40 years, the WHO Laboratory Manual for the Examination Processing of Human Semen has become a recognized and recommended manual for laboratory examinations. As such, it is a key resource for the provision of high quality, effective services to meet the needs of those individuals and couples who are facing challenges with achieving a pregnancy when desired. The manual has been widely translated and used extensively over the years by clinical and laboratory, research laboratories throughout the world. For example, the previous, the fifth edition, has been downloaded more than 575,000 times and remains one of the most widely used of WHO's technical documents. The manual is regularly revised as new techniques are validated and made available for clinical and research purposes. Following an extensive process of evidence gathering and synthesis, consultation with the world's experts, and a public review of the draft manual, the sixth edition of this key tool is now ready to be launched. This updated manual will help scientists, technicians, laboratory experts, and healthcare workers worldwide to safeguard the quality of the clinical use of human semen in laboratory settings and future research on semen. This edition should also make global comparisons easier for scientists evaluating the methods used in the manual. The updated WHO laboratory manual can help to provide information to facilitate the interpretation of the results of semen analysis. However, it is very important to note that it is not a guideline for clinical decisions on treatments for male factor infertility or for use outside of a laboratory setting. WHO is in the process of developing global guidance on infertility, including both male and female factor infertility, which will provide the evidence-informed interventions to address these conditions. Not everyone attending this launch will be aware that this manual is actually a joint product of WHO and the UN co-sponsored special human reproduction program known as HRP. This research program is based within the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research Department at WHO and is, is co-sponsored by UNICEF, UNFPA, UNDP and the World Bank, as well as WHO, with funding from several member states and foundations. We would like to acknowledge the support of HRP in the development of this manual. WHO and HRP would also like to thank the many technical experts from around the world who contributed to the review and revision of this manual. I would like to extend my special thanks to the Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Dr. Lars Bjondam, who you'll be hearing from later, for leading the technical review of the manual, and to Dr. Christina Wang for her outstanding contributions to all six editions of the manual. Special thanks are also due to all members of the editorial board, and the, and the writing team for their invaluable contributions to the manual, and particularly during this difficult period of teleworking during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd also like to express our gratitude to the many colleagues who worked on the editing, 
layout and production of the sixth edition. And personally, I would like to sincerely thank my colleagues, Igor Toskin, James Chiari, Carol Blondil, and Natalie Moray for their tireless efforts and dedication, which has led us to today's event. Once again, welcome everyone, and I'm sure you will find this event extremely useful. I'll now hand over to Igor to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for the warm welcome in and for motivation, motivational uh, speech about the launch of this long awaited document. So we can go to our next speaker, distinguished guest and speaker, uh, Professor Christina Wong from the School of Medicine, USLA, California, United States of America. As uh, in stated, uh, Christina contributed to all six editions of the manual since 1980, and her talk will be dedicated to a quick uh, overview, historical overview of the manual, starting from the first edition published in 1980. So Christina, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Igor. Next slide. Dr. Alvin Parson and Dr. Prasad in the 1970s, they were manager as well as the chair of the task force for the regulation of male fertility for the World Health Organization. The two of them recognized the need for standardization of procedures for the examination of human semen and semen cervical mucus interaction as the first passage of the sperm into the female reproductive tract. They held consultations in Barcelona, in Geneva, Hong Kong, Berlin, with 33 participants from Asia, Europe, North and South America. It was a collaborative effort of the WHO, HLP, Task Forces on the Methods for the Regulation of Male Fertility, the Diagnosis and Treatment of Infertility, and the Vaginal and Cervical Devices for Fertility Regulation. Next slide. They did not recognize, probably maybe they do, that this WHO manual for the examination of and processing of human semen, as Dr. Askew has mentioned, is recognized as providing global standards and used extensively for clinical and research laboratories for the diagnosis and treatment of the infertile couple, assessing spermatogenesis, suppression following male fertility regulation, and also for conducting large scale studies on effects of potential environmental and other toxicants on male reproduction. Next slide. In, 19, in 1980, the first edition of the so-called semen manual was published. The manual has only six pages on semen analysis, focusing on the important points of sperm density, motility and morphology, they, it provided stains and plates for morphology and also introduced a standardized form for semen analysis. The sperm cervical mucus interaction occupy eight pages and talk about the in vivo postcoital test as well as the in vitro capillary um, test and slide test. They also introduced a term normality for men and that defined that normality of semen parameters should be obtained from men whose partners were currently pregnant or whose, um, who had a history of uh, recent fertility. The editorial board consists of uh, Dr. Rune Eliasson from Sweden, uh, an expert on semen analysis, Dr. Mogesi, who is the expert on cervical mucus as well as Dr. Um, Paulson, expert on semen analysis and clinical diagnosis of male infertility, as well as um, uh, Drs. Prasad, Balsi, and Gallegos from the World Health Organization teams. Next slide. The second edition, the third and the fourth edition are really the work of Dr. Jeffrey Waits who was task force manager of the World Health Organization on the methods on regulation of male fertility when the WHO was leading, leading all the efforts in developing both reversible and non-reversible methods of male contraception. 
the three manuals it, that was published in 1987, 1992, and 1999 were supported by um, the um, a numerous andrologies workshop, both clinical and semen analysis that were held in Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. The next slide. In 1987, the manual was used for mainly for the evaluation of infertile couple and assessment of men who were, um, whose sperm suppression is, su is suppressed by potential male contraception or toxic agents. The menu was divided in two parts. The standard part, which was already in the 1980 manual, and the introduction of optional tests, semen culture, biochemical tests of the accessory glands of re male reproduction, the sonar free hamster oocyte test as a test for sperm fertilizing capacity, sperm antibody test, how to recover sperm from the semen. Uh, using a swim up technique, as well as detailed analysis of the importance of immature sperm, uh, um, immature germ cells. A spe special section were introduced for the sperm antibody test and the semen biochemistry. Importantly, next slide, they define that there should be normal values for semen variables and suggest that each laboratory develop normal ranges for men who achieve a pregnancy within a past 12 years. You will see that this took a long time to happen. But they base this on studies that were done long time ago in the 1950s and 60s, that these should be, quote, the normal values of semen um, uh, variable, including a sperm, uh, a volume, semen volume of over two meals, um, sperm concentration of 20 million, total sperm count of 40, the total motility that are progressive of 50, and the morphology of 50%, and the viability of about 50%. Next slide. In 1992, the uh, World Health Organization uh, so, um, Task Force on the uh, Regulation of Male Fertility responded to the needs at that time because of the um, advance in the techniques of assistant reproductive technology, and also the recognition that the environmental pollution may have effects on male fertility. This manual in 1992 was linked to the World Health Organization manual for the standardized investigation and diagnosis of the infertile couple, which is being revised. And, and this manual had a uh, uh, led to a controversy because at this time, the assessment of uh, sperm morphology was uh, not unified. It was the old fashioned method of assessing any sperm that looked normal under the microscope as normal. Therefore the normal sperm morphology of 50% to the strict criteria introduced in South Africa where the sperm has to be perfectly normal, shape, size, and uh, to be qualified as um, normal sperm. Therefore, in this, at this time, and you will see also in the next manual, the normal morphology here was defined arbitrary as 30%, stating that the empirical reference value was introduced without clinical studies to support the value. This led to a lot of controversy and criticism of this manual. Next slide. However, this slide in this manual in fact introduced the, the three, three different parts of the manual, the standard methods that I spoke about, the optional methods, and also the research test, the sperm function test, including the sonar-free hamster egg, the human sonar pollutes the binding test, and the echosome reaction, as well as introduction of the computer-assisted sperm analysis as tests for research. The sperm preparation techniques was grossly expanded and the introduction of the importance of quality control in an andrology lab, as well as safety procedures and the basic requirements of an andrology lab, which is 
introduced in 1992 and is present in the current manual. Next slide. The fourth edition is essentially the same. The manual is divided into three parts. In the optional part, we added the multiple spurt defects index and the hypoosmotic swelling test, which is very easy to do. In the research test, we introduce the reactive oxygen species, as you will see later on, is a marker of um, um, damages to these uh, sperm DNA. Extends and, and that the quality control methods now in, in included methods, practical methods of how to implement quality control in an andrology laboratory, and also um, included statistical analysis and consideration of counting errors. The reference range was stated very, very clearly that it should not be used as the lower semen value compatible with fertility for in vivo and in vitro. And the, and the percentage normal morphology at that time, it was suggested to be 15%, but suggested that, that this is in progress and we don't have evidence-based data. Next slide, the fifth edition that was published now over 10 years ago is the most extensive edition and the most comprehensive edition of the manual. The fifth edition provided lots of details. Some of them are really very useful. However, because it introduced um, met alternate methods, examples, notes, comments, and boxes, and the menu double in the number of pages, more than double the number of pages that sometimes in the laboratories, technicians will find it very difficult to follow. It included, importantly, that we should uh, um, include total sperm per ejaculate as a very important parameter for fertility. And it provided methods to, pro to measure very, very low sperm counts and also the errors when you are reporting azospermia, the errors um, that's associated with that report. It also includes all new morphology plates and new procedures for sperm extraction now, not only from the semen, but from the testes and uh, epididymis because of the introduction of new um, techniques, assisted reproductive techniques that is in the clinic. It developed a section of prior preservation of sperm, which is really important for fertility preservation, and updated the methods of quality control and assurance. More important, most importantly, next slide, it quoted the reference ranges and limits, and this time based on uh, evidence-based data from 400 and 1900 fertile men whose partners had a time to pregnancy of less than 12 months and used statistical analysis of, uh, of one-sided 5% as the lower reference uh, limit. The publication by Cooper et al. from using the WHO reference value for semen analysis is one of the most um, uh, quoted publication um, on male reproduction. Next slide. These are the values that was published in the sixth from the fifth edition of the um, of the uh, uh, not so-called normal values. Nowadays, should be called the reference ranges. And shown in purple are the values that are evidence based. Showing a semen volume should be probably above 1.5, 39 total sperm count, 15 million per meal as a sperm concentration. Progressive motility should be over 32%, viability over 58%, and normal forms using the very strict criteria of 4%. These data are reference ranges and should not be used again for definition of fertility in vivo or in vitro. Next, next slide. The next slide shows all the five versions of the menu until today. The World Health Organization semen menu is the gold standard for semen analysis throughout the world. 
is the one, one of the most downloaded publications of the World Health Organization. And I'm a proud and humbled to be associated with all six editions of the Siemens menu. Thank you. Yeah, Christina, thank you very much indeed for this uh, very interesting, fascinating uh, overview of the all previous five editions and uh, particularly accentuating on the key aspects that were reflected in each edition according to the development in the technology and understanding uh, of the needs for the semen examination and processing. Uh, according to a retrospective uh, review of the statistics of WHO that we completed recently, uh, we can confirm that all these editions generated a lot of interest in the professional community, and all these editions were permanently among the most demanded, downloaded, distributed WHO documents that confirms again how this document is important for the, for the field for the colleagues working in the sexual and reproductive health. Thank you indeed, Christina, for a fascinating talk. So we are going to our next uh, distinguished speaker, uh, my dear colleague, Dr. James Chiari. James Chiari is the head of the Contraception and Fertility Care Unit of the same department, Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research Department of the Health uh, World Organization, Geneva. And uh, James will talk uh, about uh, the manual in general and the sixth edition of the manual, particularly in the context of the fertility care. So James, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Igor. And it's also a pleasure for me to join uh, everyone at this launch of the manual. And uh, for me, I would really like to emphasize from uh, where Professor Wang left. Uh, about the importance of having a gold standard uh, for semen analysis and also for processing uh, semen. My main message for my presentation is that the manual should not be seen only in the context of infertility, but it has many applications within fertility care and uh, contraception. I will highlight uh, its uses both in clinical and research setting for investigating infertility and uh, also for fertility preservation and also in male uh, contraception. And also I will talk a bit about uh, how well the manual fits into the other work that uh, we are doing within WHO on uh, fertility care. As uh, many of you are aware, this is an area that has not received as much public health attention as it deserves. And uh, we would like to really call out uh, that this area uh, receives more attention. And in this way, the semen manual is actually a very important product uh, from our department. And uh, next slide. So in terms of investigating infertility, we know that uh, infertility is uh, commonly actually blamed on the female partner, but we know that it can also have male causes or it could be unexplained. Uh, analyzing and uh, proper processing of uh, semen is actually at the center of identifying uh, what is the cause of uh, infertility. And without this being done properly, then it will not be possible for us to properly manage uh, infertile uh, couples. And it's very important for us, and we are very excited to see that this manual is being used globally, that we actually have comparable uh, results. Uh, because we know that many times uh, clans with infertility are treated uh, in one facility and then in another facility. They are also evaluated from time to time. And for these results to be comparable, it's very good for us that we have the semen manual from WHO that can be used as a gold standard. So whichever lab uh, is doing the testing then gets uh, similar uh, results. So on the next slide, I would like to talk a bit uh, about fertility uh, preservation. Our understanding of uh, fertility has really progressed a lot in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, we have better understanding 
of uh, the role of uh, semen, sperm, how we can store, uh, how we can store over. And now it is actually possible for patients that are undergoing treatment procedures like chemotherapy, radiation or hormone therapy, or any other uh, intervention that may affect future fertility to be able to preserve uh, their semen and uh, sperm that can be later used for uh, reproduction. And this is a very important uh, advance uh, in science and in technology. And, but for it really to bear the results that we want, it is very important that we adhere to these standards that have been set out for processing uh, human uh, semen. So this issue of sperm preparation and uh, cryopreservation uh, will not be possible if we do not have these uh, procedures. And if as a global community, we do not adopt uh, these standards of uh, processing uh, human semen. And uh, finally, the other area I wanted to highlight on the next slide is on the issue of uh, contraception. Uh, although female contraception or female methods of contraception are the most commonly used, uh, we have, there is increasing interest in male uh, contraception. And even today, about 25% of couples uh, using contraception are actually relying on a male method of contraception, would be it vasectomy, be it condoms, or even traditional methods such as withdrawal. And particularly for vasectomy, uh, semen analysis and, uh, is critical for us to be able to, to detect whether the, the procedure has been uh, effective. And this will not be possible if we do not adopt the procedures as outlined in this manual uh, for us to be able to conclusively say that uh, sperm is absent or is still uh, present uh, when we are evaluating uh, men who have had uh, vasectomy. And currently there's actually ongoing greater efforts uh, to develop new methods of reversible male contraception. Uh, these methods are either hormonal methods that suppress spermatogenesis or even reversible occlusion of the vas. These are methods that are not yet available but are under development. The evaluation of semen and will be really critical in monitoring uh, these methods uh, during use and has also been invaluable in the research that has gone on in the development of these uh, methods. So we should not see this uh, manual as something that is only useful for infertility treatment. It is a manual that should is very useful in various areas of uh, fertility care, and also in uh, research. And uh, next slide. So I will highlight two, two things that we are doing in the department in the area of uh, fertility care, uh, for which we think that this manual will be very uh, a core uh, tool. One, we are in the process of developing guidelines on the prevention, diagnosis, and management of uh, infertility. Uh, the goal of these guidelines will be to provide guidance on, uh, on this uh, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of infertility, so as to improve the standard of care globally and particularly with a focus of low resource settings. We know that uh, infertility is one area that has received very little attention and millions and millions of couples are actually suffering because they are not able to access uh, care. And even when they access, the standard of care tends to be not uh, appropriate. I will not go through the specific objectives of these uh, guidelines, uh, but uh, overall, uh, they are following uh, the process, uh, which is evidence-based, the grade process uh, that we use here in WHO. We have about 35 uh, PICO questions that will be addressed. And because these are the first guidelines, it is quite an engaging process. And uh, we are really looking excitedly 
that towards the end of this year or early next year, we'll actually be able to issue the first WHO guidelines on prevention, diagnosis and management of infertility. For you to implement these guidelines and for us to implement these guidelines, of course, the semen manual will be at the core in terms of evaluating uh, infertile men and uh, infertile uh, couples. Therefore, this will be something that will be very important for us to keep an eye out for and for which we anticipate that the semen manual will actually provide a critical additional uh, support. And on the next slide, uh, the last uh, issue I just wanted to highlight uh, that we are working on is the estimates of the prevalence of uh, infertility. And we know that infertility is a global health issue. It's affecting millions of people of reproductive age. And, but we are not uh, very confident in terms of how many people are actually affected by this issue. And therefore, it has been uh, sometimes not as great a focus of uh, attention. And I think as Ian uh, raised at the beginning that uh, it is the right of all men, women, and couples to be able to access their rights to health including their reproductive, sexual reproductive health uh, rights. And this includes uh, the prevention, the diagnosis and the management of uh, infertility. And we need to be able to understand uh, whether the interventions we are putting in place are working, which will not be possible without us getting a better understanding. The use of the semen manual will help us a lot uh, to better understand beyond the big numbers of how many are affected, to better understand what is the etiology, and also to shed light on the relative contribution of various uh, factors, and to be able to understand whether there are trends that are seen over time, and some of the reasons for these trends, uh, if uh, we observe them. So it will be really, uh, really complement uh, this work of estimates uh, that we are doing and that we, are, we are anticipate that at the end of this year we'll be releasing at least the global and regional estimates of uh, infertility to further refine uh, these estimates uh, that we have. And next slide. Yeah, so I would like to end there and uh, hand over to Igor uh, to introduce the next presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, dear James, thank you very much indeed for this comprehensive overview and positioning the manual, uh, including six edition of the manual uh, within context of fertility care, as well as within context of the ongoing work in our department and in WHO uh, on sexual and reproductive health. And uh, so eloquently uh, explaining uh, what the potential role and utility of this manual, not only in terms of the clinical aspects, but also the strategic information gathering for uh, assessing the infertility burden uh, and all other aspects that uh, we are prioritizing in, in terms of the reproductive uh, health and particularly male reproductive health in WHO. Thank you very much indeed. So we are moving to the set of the presentations related directly to the sixth edition of the manual. And the first speaker who will give a presentation on the sixth edition, it's editor-in-chief of this uh, edition, Dr. Uh, Lars uh, Björndal from Kalarinsk Kalarinsky University Institute, Sweden, Stockholm. And uh, I would like once again to acknowledge the outstanding contribution uh, by Lars to this sixth edition uh, having a leading role in the technical development of the sixth edition. So Lars, the floor is yours and uh, Lars will walk us through the main aspects of the sixth edition, particularly what is new comparing to the fifth edition. Lars, please. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank the entire editorial committee for all our 
constructive discussions leading towards this, uh, leading forward towards this uh, it revised uh, edition of the manual. I came first into the work into the WHO Seaman Manual 15, 16 years ago. Please go back. And I also would like to extend my thanks to uh, Igor Toskin and Karel Blondel for all their work to keep the, uh, the editorial committee and especially myself on track to get this done. Okay, so the outline of the presentation is to first present very short what is kept, what is new, what is discarded. And then I will spend some time on the matter of limits. We have already heard from Christina Wang about that, and we will hear more from Chris, uh, Christopher Barrett. And I will also mention a little about the matter of standardization, which also have been touched upon on the earlier presentation. But in the editorial committee, we found these matters very important and have had long and good discussions about that. Next, please. So what is kept? Well, the best techniques based on laboratory science, the basic semen examination has not really been changed very much, uh, but the, well, it's more like housekeeping to try to make the text even easier for uh, lab staff to follow. We have done the extended analysis. We have made some changes between basic or uh, earlier called uh, standard analysis and extended analysis. And finally, we have also research tests, those that are described as a help for laboratories wanting to expand and do more. And if we go back, please, uh, the basic semen examination, that is what we would say is the what every laboratory doing semen analysis should be able to do. Extended analysis, uh, I will explain a little why we have shifted some over to extended. <clears throat> they are as best described as we can find it, but there may be difficulties in interpreting how much value it is in each, each of these. And also with the research test, we have provided that as a help for laboratories to find their way, but there may still be much of improvement in the two latter parts of the uh, manual. So next, please. So what we've done difference in the basic is to recommend more clearly one procedure, and that is for the sake of standardization. And that means that there are fewer investigations within the, within the basic section. We had discussions and where we found that the scientific evidence for clinical value of certain uh, assessment is weaker than the tradition to do it because we have always done it. Then we moved that to the extended examination to exp uh, those who want to do that, uh, how should it be done in the best way? Next. So the basic examination, main methods, examples, and explanations are more separated. It turned out uh, when we tested with the uh, lab staff members that it was difficult to follow the, uh, the procedures because there were so many examples and explanations within the procedure description. So it, and it was not always the most logical order. So when in, in principle, we kept everything in concentration. For motility, we have returned to the former four category uh, categorization, and that is rapid, slow, non-progressive, and then move time. If there is a demand, there is no interest in distinguishing between rapid and slow progressive sperm, then of course it's possible to do the, uh, only that. But there is scientific evidence for clinical value of detecting absence of rapid progressive sperm, both to understand in, uh, infertility in vivo and for probable uh, problem with ordinary IVF so that ICSI could be the best choice for couples where the man's sperm actually are moving very slowly forward. I should also mention that it's not a matter that you uh, that pe people in the lab should be able, must be able to set the exact speed of all sperm. It's just to distinguish between rapid and slow. 
uh, yeah. For vitality, uh, the recommendation is you don't have to do that on all samples because the most simple way to determine vitality is to look at the motility. If a sperm is motile, then it's alive. So only if there are very few motile, then vitality test is important to see how many sperm are immotile and alive and how many are immotile and dead. And uh, based on scientific reports, there is no need for replicate assessments. For morphology, uh, the WHO has recommended, the manual has recommended the tiger bear strict criteria uh, using staining primarily by the ad sperm adapted Papa Nicolau staining, and that remains. And <clears throat> there is more stress on morphology to not only look for head abnormalities, which is quite common with these strict criteria. It's also important to look if the tails are abnormal, if there is a problem in the midpiece and so on. And it's the same thing there. The most important is to know the criteria well. Uh, replicate assessment is not required. Next, please. So examples, what goes beyond the basic examination? Sperm DNA damage or sperm DNA fragmentation, markers for genital tract inflammation, sequence of ejaculation, semen biochemistry, anti-sperm antibodies, and indices of multiple sperm defects, and also sperm and aploidy assessment. Among research procedures, we have oxidative stress, acrosome reaction, sperm chromatin structure and stability, cat spur channels, CASA, that is the, uh, of course, the computer assisted sperm analysis. And also, we have kept and tried to develop the sperm preparation techniques cryopreservation of spermatozoa, and the chapter on quality assurance and uh, quality control. Uh, I know that from giving many courses in basic semen analysis has created lots of worries in laboratories and among laboratory staff members. And we have tried to make it more uh, fluent in describing and taking away lots of mathematical description and trying to describe in word how you calculate a number of important measures of quality. So we'll hopefully it will be easier to follow that for people who are not specialists in statistics and so on. Next, please. Uh, what is discarded then? Well, we discussed about the sperm cervical penetration test and decided not to include it anymore because we found that uh, it is used in very few places and the, old, uh, the earlier uh, manuals could provide the information. We have actually nothing new about that. We also excluded the hamster egg penetration test in, by, uh, even stronger on that. It's not at all uh, of the same interest that as it was many years ago when that was supposed and thought to be a useful test uh, before going to IVF. Yes, next please. Then a few words on the matter of limits. For the imprint, imprint interpretation of results, of course, limits between normal and pathology are essential. The problem here, for semen examination is that there are no real distinct limits. Uh, and I would say, as uh, Christian Wang also showed, that the earlier simple reference limits are often misunderstood. And we could take this as a starting point, distribution of data from reference men, men in reference populations. They don't represent limits between fertile and subfertile. And I will give some examples why it is like this. One, the reference population is actually mixed. Time to conception of 12 months or less. That will actually include men with semen quality issues, but the couples that manage to have a, a 
conception within 12 months. They are, of course, lucky and we can congratulate them. But the, the reference population is not uh, completely well defined there. And it will also exclude men with longer or no time to conception and still having good semen because, well, the time to conception also depends on the female. And there are also some interesting studies, some old and some very new. The shorter time to conception, the better semen characteristics. Well, already in 1968, Titzer showed that 80% of couples who stopped contraception would have a conception within four months. And the remaining 20% who had the conception used the so many more uh, months. And Kehani this year published that shorter time to conception uh, was present when semen was much better than the lower fifth percentile, uh, showing that, uh, the, the, well, the difference uh, earlier shown then, that we have a reference population with 10, with up to 12 months time to conception, will include men with, actually, it's quite likely that uh, there will be men with lower semen analysis results included in that group. Okay, number two. Next, please. We should also remember that semen examination has different goals. We should think about it like assessment of male reproductive organ function. We could have follow-up of andrological treatment of the man. And as uh, Jim Kerr talked about, assessment of male con contraceptive treatments. And one important aspect is still a choice of assisted reproductive treatment modality. But all these different goals would have different uh, limits of interest. When is that? And I had the last one, epidemiological and environmental studies, where you want to see the influence of uh, external factors. Uh, then uh, you should not only go for this lower fifth percentile. It's other aspect that probably is more important. So, next slide. Decision limits are in many cases more useful than those reference limits, limits based on reference population data. Uh, so when clinical investigation are essential to discover, for instance, endocrine or genetic disorders, that is an important decision limit. How low should the sperm count be before you start doing these uh, Examination. They are usually, the genetic tests are usually quite expensive. So it's, it shouldn't be done on all men, but when is it really likely to find that? And also to decide if clinical interventions are sufficient. That in Stockholm, we treat lots of men with uh, hypogonadism, and we actually use sperm production as a measurement of when the uh, clinical interventions are sufficient, even if the men are not interested in children or a child at that time, but we take that as a measurement of the function of these organs. And of course, another decision, when is it useful, when, which treatment would be most optimal for uh, IVF or ICSI? And also to uh, other decision limits, when, do external factors actually influence sperm production and sperm function? And I would say we need these, uh, we need information to develop decision limits for these different uses of semen analysis. So <clears throat> global standardization is necessary for the development of andrology and reproductive medicine. To, it's necessary to generate new diagnosis and new treatments. We have to, well, that means that since many of these causes, etiologies, can be quite scarce in one region or one country or one town, uh, it's important that we can use data and information from different centers, multi-center studies. And then it's absolutely necessary to have 
comparable methods. And that is also the case if we want to implement techniques and limits developed in other centers. If we don't use the same standardized techniques, it's uh, useless. And I would say without robust data, any scientific investigation will not reveal true pathology. If we have very poor robustness among data, we can actually miss out important uh, correlations. And therefore, I also say misinterpreted limits will not disclose factors of importance for infertility. Okay, next, please. So, conclusions. Uh, the, the new edition, uh, basic examination of semen focused on stepwise procedures, evidence-based techniques, support, uh, it's actually supported by a new formal ISO standard that is the same as for the basic examination. And if we go back to, so I can, uh, there are the decision limits that need to be developed, but we should remember that, and I support fully this standardization is needed for the development of andrology and reproductive medicine, standardization of laboratory techniques. Next, please. So I've been giving similar presentations, not on the WHO sixth edition, but semen examination is not only related to fertilization success in vivo or in vitro. I would say it's necessary for the proper investigation of male reproductive functions in many different situations. Thank you. Lars, thank you very much indeed for so clear uh, presentation on the main elements of the sixth edition, uh, particularly development uh, uh, reflected in this edition since uh, the previous edition. Um, it's, 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 it's important to know that your presentation reflects a very hard work of the editorial board and all contributors to this edition in terms of uh, gathering evidence, assessment of evidence, uh, synthesis of the evidence, and finally descri describing this in the sixth edition. And you did so eloquently. So thank you very much indeed for this. And we are moving to our next uh, distinguished speaker. It's Professor Christopher Barrett. Christ, uh, Christopher Barrett from the University of Dundee, uh, United Kingdom. And uh, Chris will give a talk on the distribution of the semen examination results, new findings, main challenges, and way forward. Uh, these reflected and presented in the sixth edition, and uh, Chris will walk us through the main aspects of uh, chapter eight, where in fact uh, these elements of the manual are described. So Chris, thank you indeed, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Igor. Thank you very much uh, also to the committee and for inviting me to give the presentation today. Uh, it's first of all, it's important to say that uh, it's been a true pleasure being part of this uh, editorial committee over the last uh, uh, three years. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic privilege to be part of such a, such a, a, a great uh, initiative. Uh, I don't have any significant conflicts of interest that would change the way I would discuss uh, the data with you today, 100% of my salary comes from the University of Dundee uh, in Scotland. Uh, the next slide, please. So I'm going to go through today a little bit about the distribution of the parameters for, for, for uh, semen analysis based on uh, one population. I'm going to give some details about the context of that, and perhaps then with the challenges in the way forward, uh, uh, hopefully set up a nice discussion uh, at the end. The next slide, please. So the full uh, information related to the distribution of semen uh, uh, examination is presented in a paper uh, from Martin Campbell, uh, which was published in uh, Andrology. And here's the reference for, for those of you who are interested in the primary data. The next slide, please. So as mentioned, there's been uh, five previous editions of the manual from 1980 to 2010 and they've been uh, hotly uh, discussed and uh, hotly debated. 
and they are very popular uh, in downloads and in uh, uh, your local bookstores. Um, what's the important thing in the context of what I'm talking about today? For the next slide, please. Is that the fifth edition from 2010 was the primary edition which contained comprehensive data to support what was then uh, described as the reference values uh, in chapter eight. And this was the first time that the WHO had basically obtained large information related to these uh, uh, SEM analysis parameters. And this slide contains uh, the data from Trevor Cooper and colleagues, which was published uh, in Human Reproduction Update in 2010, which is the basis, of course, for the, uh, the reference ranges for SEM analysis uh, parameters. And what this shows under the blue arrow is the is the district is this, this full centiles and the fifth centile is represented as what's uh, deemed to be the lower uh, reference range. And for semen volume, that was 1.5, for sperm concentration was 15, et cetera, et cetera. And these are largely uh, used throughout the world and uh, are part of the, of the fifth edition of the semen analysis manual. Next slide, please. So the question then uh, came for us as an editorial committee, uh, is this sufficient uh, to use, just, just use again, uh, or do we actually need to obtain uh, extra information if the extra information is in fact available? Um, it was noted that the original analysis, uh, which was from the WHO, published by, by first author being Trevor, was actually uh, a reference population using standardized methods uh, where well, there's two to seven day sexual abstinence, and it covered about eight countries from three continents. However, the last publication in there was prior to 2010, and we felt that actually there may be some extra data that we could add to that information to see whether how robust these uh, uh, distributions were. So we updated the literature as of uh, 2020. We did a classic uh, literature search, con which contained uh, uh, time to pregnancy of, uh, lesser, uh, of 12, less than 12 months, uh, in vivo conception, the data collected as per the WHO fifth edition, and obviously this is for patients, so there's no uh, uh, infertility patients or patients attending the clinic, so the classic what's termed to be fertile men. The data was collected up till October 2019, and the primary author was Martin, who, who got a lot of this data together. In addition to that, we did a citation search, primarily based on, on the Cooper paper, because this is, as Christine has mentioned, a highly cited, pa cited paper, you know, 1,500 plus citations. And then we searched the literature, and we're looking for data and papers published, really, as related to the, to the fertile man. The next slide, please. So we identified uh, a number of studies, actually, but once we'd whittled this down, significantly, there was only five uh, studies uh, where we could uh, verify a lot of the information and we contacted the author and the authors had agreed us to give us Excel spreadsheets, basically provide all the data to us. And that was important for us because we wanted to analyze all the data together. And we had a number of questions regarding methods used, uh, recruitment, uh, uh, et cetera. So you will see that these uh, new uh, studies and new data sets come from uh, Italy, Iran, Egypt, China, and, and Greece. And the, and the reference containing the publication is presented there. And those uh, authors very, very kindly provided the data to us. And it's a great privilege to be part of such a network where people are so generous to do that. The next slide, please. So we also obtained the original data, which was uh, used for the 2010 uh, uh, reference ranges and distributions, and that was provided kindly by the WHO editorial committee. And the hypothesis and the idea was to bring these two data sets together to then see if there are any uh, uh, updates and any differences uh, over the last uh, periods. Next slide, please. So now we can see that the uh, two here uh, data sets are contain different distributions related to their origin. So different studies, for example, some come from Australia, some come from the United States, 
the new data sets come from China, uh, Iran as an example. So there's a, there's a much wider spread of the data geogra geographically. And the numbers, of course, are, are significantly uh, increased. So all of this data comes together to produce uh, uh, the new distributions. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, table three from, the, from Martin's primary data paper. And what we have here is you can see the end values related to semen volume, sperm concentration, sperm number, et cetera. And here is the distribution of those information and the fifth center, which is the same as presented uh, for example in uh, Trevor, Trevor's paper. And we see here that the values are 1.4, 16 million sperm per mil, 42% uh, total motility, 30% progressive motility, uh, but no, there's no real difference between uh, the values as they were uh, presented in the 2010 manual. But of course, <coughs> excuse me, but of course there's a larger uh, database present here. So the next slide, please. <coughs> so what, what does all this mean for us? What, what, what's, why are we getting excited? And <laughs> why should we, uh, why should we pay any attention to this? What does it really mean? Well, first of all, I think it's a larger number of subjects. And allowing a larger number of subjects give us, gives us more confidence, really, in the data that's being collected on the distribution of this particular, to particular group. There's a larger number of countries. There's a larger number of continents. So in, in theory, it's a more global representation of, of the so-called fertile male. There's some data now from China and Africa, as an example. I think very importantly, the committee were very keen that actually the data was freely available uh, add, to add to, to scrutinize, to, to discuss, to, to change, to whatever. And that's available at the Martins made that available at the University of Dundee uh, website where the Excel spreadsheet is that instantly downloadable. Um, so you can see, see the primary data that we use that, that, that is of course available for you. Hopefully that data continually can be added to and then we can see how that might change your observations. So, and the other thing which I thought was really very, uh, very warm and very comforting was the fact that the distribution of values that we see is just pretty much exactly the same as what it was in, in 2010. And that gives us some real high confidence uh, um, that, the, that the data is relatively robust. And it's consistent, of course, with the literature over the last sort of 30 or 40 years. However, I think there are some caveats and some lessons that we need to learn. Um, I was incredibly surprised, actually, at the low number of studies that we could uh, access. Uh, to only add five studies over a period of 11 years struck me as, as, as just, it was just really low. I was really surprised. I, when we were discussing this internally, I, I just couldn't believe that there were so few studies. Uh, okay, so there were some things, some studies we couldn't use for various reasons. One of the authors had died, for example, we couldn't access the data. But, but even so, the low numbers of studies were, were very, very surprising. To me. And also, they're regionally very restricted. You know, we don't have any high quality data, or we hadn't at that time, from South America, for example. We only have one country in Africa, that's Egypt. You know, that doesn't represent all of Africa or at least we need to determine if that does represent all of that. So I think there are many questions with regard to that. And I think as Lars has mentioned, and as all of us have mentioned to you today, it's very important that we have robust methods to analyze data. And in fact, sometimes it's very difficult for us to determine what methods have actually been used, even though they'd said they used the WHO methods. When we drilled into that, it was quite difficult to find out exactly what had been done. And openness, transparency, and detailed methods would really help us in that arena. And I think that's important to, to take home message. The next slide, please. So just to give you some context, I wanted to give two context points. Number one is to reiterate, and hopefully that, that you're quite now well aware now, that although uh, these are distributions of the, of the fertile male uh, in vivo pregnancies, et cetera, there is tremendous overlap between different groups. And of course, this is a paper from McLeod and Gould in the 1950s and 1951, actually. So that's a large number of years, <laughs> years ago. 
And we can see that the distributions, although they're actually statistically different, there's a substantial overlap between them. So, so actually that's a very important point that we've made continually, I think, too. The next slide, please. I think the second context for seam analysis, which we sort of haven't talked about yet, uh, which is up for discussion, is increasingly we're starting to understand that, for example, men with subfertility live sicker and die younger than normal men. And these are examples from uh, Michael Eisenberg from the United States, where there's been a lot of these, done a lot of investigations with his colleagues and teams, in fact, around the world, looking at this uh, as a relationship between subfertility, seam analysis, and potential uh, morbidity, and in fact, mortality. And I think as we understand more, we'll understand that doing a seam analysis may actually take a different slant. And as Lars and the team have mentioned, it's not just looking at prognosis and diagnosis, there are many other aspects to a semen, semen analysis. And I think a high quality semen analysis may in fact be a sentinel marker of uh, health. The next slide, please. So what, what, what does this bring us for the future? Now we've had some context, where are we gonna go in the future? Well, I think it's, it's essential that we have large prospective studies on very clearly defined populations. In fact, from geographically and culturally diverse uh, backgrounds and locations, and in fact, related to economic regions. The, the, the paucity of data in this, this area is really, really restricting a lot of what we can do. And as Lars has mentioned, it'd be very important to also have different detailed backgrounds on this, these particular models. You know, how could we then look for wild deletions, et cetera, et cetera. And I think at the same time, we have to realize that we have to, all of us combine together to actually try and get these studies off the ground. In theory, you should have prospective studies continually ongoing that can be added to and developed. And I, I see no reason why we can't do this in reproductive medicine. You know, we've seen from over the last 18 months how powerful a global approach to dealing with medical issues can be. And I think we've got to learn by that and actually try and develop those global approaches. And I'm very privileged with Chris and, and, and colleagues to be part of a, a global initiative to look at male reproductive health. And I think part of that is trying to get us to understand what the challenges are and doing studies and initiating these long-term prospective studies, which will substantially help us to identify and look at information in the future. But of course, technology doesn't stand still, thankfully. Technological developments may actually complement or in fact change part of the way we do seam analysis in 2030. So when the editorial board sitting down in 2029 or whatever, um, maybe there's lots of technical changes that have happened to actually push the personalized medicine uh, agenda, the different technology for looking at that sperm, for example, may then help us in the future to actually uh, look at ways of doing seam analysis slightly differently. So I think 2030 holds oh, some, some really fantastic uh, promise and, and excitement for, for data sets and information. The next slide, please. So in closing, I would like to just acknowledge the part that's played. This is a picture of Wee Martin. Martin's been uh, instrumental in driving and the and force behind getting this data in the project. I'm really grateful for him to, to do that. I'm also grateful for the WHO for obtaining the primary data. Uh, and that, that, was, that was just fantastic to be able to do that. And, and to reiterate again, for people who provide us with the Excel sheet, spreadsheets for our data and the studies that are done, without them, we could not have got these, these uh, distributions. And I want to thank them publicly. Thank you very much for doing that. It's been a tremendous uh, privilege to be working with you all over Thank you very much, Iger and Lars. Dear yeah, Chris, thank you very much indeed for a very clear, concise presentation on the new findings within context of the distribution of the semen examination results, uh, particularly making the focus on the purpose of the data included in the sixth edition based on the review that you co-leaded and co-coordinated. And I would like to thank you once again for taking this role in the publication that well that was used in fact for 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 this specific chapter in the sixth edition and the special thanks for emphasizing uh, the main challenges and probably the way forward to address the existing uh, data gap in this field 
and particularly emphasizing the needs for possibly uh, globally representative prospective study, it's extremely important. And this thinks us about what we have to do in the future. Thank you indeed, Chris. And uh, with that, we are moving to our uh, next and final presentation, uh, formal presentation uh, in our webinar, which will be co-presented uh, by two colleagues, Professor uh, Stefan Schlatt from the Münster University, Germany. It's a WHO collaborating center. And uh, Professor uh, Mario Fistin from the uh, University of Philippines. Manila College of the Medicine and the Philippine General Hospital. As well, uh, Mario is a former colleague of the uh, Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research Department and HRP. So uh, Mario and Stefan will talk about uh, practical consideration for the end users of the sixth edition. Uh, Stefan, Mario, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Igor. And um, I'd like to say hello to my friend and colleague, Stefan. And I think I could say that it is a very exciting time because we are finally launching the sixth edition of the Siemen, WHO Siemen Manual. Yes, hello, Mario. Indeed, it is very exciting. Uh, it was uh, a real pleasure. Um, and we were thinking about it, how to start the whole process. And when we met 2017 in Copenhagen, I think that was a really good start because it was a rather small meeting, but it was a very intense meeting. And we could get started there and uh, had many thoughts about uh, the next version of the menu. Yes, um, it was my first time to attend the International Congress of Andrology. And as a WHO staff member at that time, I was very happy and surprised that the Seaman Manual was a very important document that was being cited as a reference in almost every lecture and almost every talk had given reference to the manual. I was very proud and happy, but I uh, was also very much impressed at how much everybody was citing and using the manual. In, indeed, it is true. And until today, the reference which you just heard a few times about from Trevor Cooper in Human Reproduction Update from 2010 is, is very heavily quoted. And the semen manual is almost present in every anthology paper until today. So it is an amazing, amazing document. Do you know what the performance of the manual was in terms of a WHO perspective? Oh, um, I think Ian mentioned it and a few others during this evening's talk or this afternoon's talk that it is one of the most popular and most downloaded documents in the WHO website, over uh, 575,000 downloads over the past 10 years. Um, what also impressed me, it, is, it has been translated into many languages, into German, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Turkish, Chinese, and Japanese. Um, we usually translate into French and Russian but we have to check whether those versions exist. And I know that as we are talking, already there are plans to translate the sixth edition into at least the French and uh, Spanish. So, and as mentioned, it is still widely uh, quoted and referenced in many of the papers now in andrology, even if the edition, the, the fifth edition, came out 11 years ago. So I'm very much impressed about how popular and how widely used the Siemen Manual is. Indeed, our, our center as a collaboration center had the task to translate it into German. And it was quite tough because I had to do the statistics part, which was even difficult in any language for me, but it was, it was too fun to do that. And the German version became a real book so you could buy the book and it was a complete sellout in between. So it was quite impressive to see that. And even the Germans had to go back to the downloadable version in the English. Um, and that for some time was, was quite amazing. But do you think um, that this has really spread into developing countries? And have you heard stories how it was used? Yes. Um, uh, so when I was going around, usually in Asia and Africa, the manual is being used by some small laboratories to ensure that the procedures they are doing for the assessment of male 
the, the semen or the male fertility are, are being done correctly and properly. What is also good is that the manual also describes the reagents and the equipment that need to be used for the procedures. So if you are operating a small laboratory, you could already get the, the reagents and the equipment that you need to purchase and to procure so that you would be uh, getting only the essential things you need. You don't have to spend so much more. And also the quality aspect in the, in the procedures. Um, the, because there is a quality control uh, chapter and that there are also the procedures being described in the various sections, the yeah, laboratories use it to ensure quality based on the different um, material found in the book. And this is very important for them, especially if they're using it for certification processes. And to make sure that the laboratories adhere to these safety standards and to the high quality standards, they, they have to cite a reference why they are doing such procedures that way. And also, if you're a small laboratory and you want to expand, you would be able to read the, the advanced procedures and the research procedures so that you would be able to read it, learn about it, and use it in order to prepare and to advance for scale up. But for, so that's how the developing countries are using it. But I have, I know that from your center in Munster that you have also used the manual in training. And I know that there are many uh, attendees to this course and um, which your, your center has offered this uh, course for many, many years. The, as we have heard, the sixth edition has new uh, practical recommendations, which are partly going back to the previous um, descriptions in the earlier ver versions of the manual that we have heard of, about today. Do you see any needs for training programs like the Qualdega or the UK NECWAS to adopt and change their training programs? I think that's a very good question. And it was always true that when the new version of the manual appeared, that um, the ad adoption to these new uh, rules and guidelines was following quickly. So indeed, the manual is physically present in all of the uh, labs and in all of our working places. So that's, of course, then the baseline of where we all start. And I think the, the, the training programs should now have the new version on their desks and, and train um, according to the new guidelines and the new recommendations. On the other hand, um, there is not so much difference. I think what we did, we, we checked validity, we checked practicalities in our um, editorial board, and we, we, we tried to make an sometimes even easier recommendation and sometimes even more practical recommendations. So I think that standardization should be easily achievable. I think what is also very important, we we were of the opinion that technicians are still superior to purely digital systems. So I think we, inc we include a chapter on digital systems, but we will really like to train technicians throughout the world that, that the same standard is followed in all, in all countries. And I think in that respect, this is a wonderful uh, manual and that we can really train from that manual uh, all of the very highly qualified technicians. So that will be a task. Of course, it's very encouraging that the, as we heard from Chris in the previous talk, the thresholds and limits for most endpoints are quite stable and they even got, um, got reconfirmed. So it's encouraging to, uh, and motivating to the trainers um, that they can teach this um, recommendations now and that they can really um, have a wonderful quality program which will, which will lead to, to comparable data throughout the world for the next coming years. What will be important perhaps also for the various societies uh, in the andrology field is that we train the trainers in the next couple of years. It will be an important task so that we take this new recommended values and this new recommended procedures and train the trainers uh, that we have the same standard throughout the world. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, um, and, I, and you could see the potential of the manual for many, many aspects that includes the service provision, the preparation for uh, quality 
uh, assurance within the laboratory and for expansion. And when we were discussing the plans for the new edition, we know that the manual provides a very good guidance for the highest global standards in sperm analysis. And we can actually, lead, this could actually lead to a harmonization and, uh, and, and for all the various procedures. But since we are looking forward to the future and, uh, and Chris has mentioned that a little bit, do you see any methodolo methodological breakthroughs which may be in the horizon that may be implemented for the seventh edition? So we're just launching the sixth and we are beginning to talk already about the seventh. And this will be coming in the years, in the following years. I mean, we all know that, uh, that there was a lot of development and Christina showed that very nicely over the many years. And uh, the manual is at a point where um, we also have to reflect modern technology. And uh, I think there are of course um, developments on the horizon which, we, which will be coming into our field in the next couple of years. And of course, we are all scientists and we are all of the most modern centers. And it was very difficult for us to decide uh, which methods are we not showing. And uh, we were very enthusiastic about new developments, but this is a semen manual for the basic procedures. So we, I think we had to take a very strong focus on giving this. But of course, the computerized analysis and the digital analysis of sperm samples is on the horizon. And it will be very interesting to see how these algorithms will change our work in the laboratories in the next couple of years. And with more and more better imaging and, uh, and better algorithms to analyze these pictures, it will definitely be um, some adjust adjustments in the seventh edition. There are new endpoints, we just discussed it. Um, we, some of them we included, DNA damage, motility patterns, channels and receptors are very important for sperm function. Currently, they are extra important methods which we can do in some specialized centers but they will definitely also be coming as kits in a few years. And then it is a question of how do we want to incorporate those? And there are of course, lots of molecular aspects on sperm, DNA integrity, membrane channels, motility patterns, which may also become very important in the next few years. So I think it is a very dynamic field. I'm looking forward to have new developments and we will incorporate those when they are valid, when they are ready to go into a standard uh, format. Yes, and we, Actually, the new developments for the past 10 years, we had to look at them and see whether they are emerging or uh, for uh, research purposes, or actually we could already put them in the routine tests. So um, we, this is actually looking forward to the future and we are looking for more developments and which may give more impact for the next edition. All right, Mario, it was very much fun talking to you as always. Uh, it will be important now to let other people ask some questions and to, to have the audience and the users in, incorporated. So we give, we give it back to Igor uh, for the final session of this webinar. Thank you. Dear Mario, dear Stefan, thank you very much indeed for this fantastic uh, session. Very innovative and uh, really uh, I personally enjoy it very much uh, how we address the uh, perspective of uh, end users in terms of uh, further use of this manual in the field for different purposes. And thank you very much indeed for um, uh, underlining several uh, aspects that we have to consider in terms of the technology development, particularly digital technology and well development in the public health uh, clinical medicine that obviously should be considered in terms of uh, use of this manual and of course we hope upcoming uh, not upcoming but the next <laughs> edition of the manual seventh edition of the manual there are a lot of opportunities and um, uh, the, the questions about translation use of the uh, manual uh, in different languages is extremely appropriate and uh, we WHO will try uh, to do our best in order to translate the manual as it was done for the previous editions in, in the languages uh, in other languages and uh, we, we initiated the discussion with our partners and uh, we hope that this will be done progressively starting first with the official UN languages, and then as it was done for the fifth edition of the manual in other languages as well. And um, 
probably some training materials that you listed. Uh, also, we need to think about how to work on that and uh, how to support and facilitate the use of the manual by clinicians, technicians, and researchers. So thank you once again for um, uh, underlining all these issues and your uh, fascinating talk. Thank you. So we are close to the end of our webinar. We have just a few minutes. Um, we have several, several questions from the audience, and we thank you all for generating these very important questions. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, the time will not allow us to answer all questions, but we will compile all your questions in order to develop frequent, uh, uh, frequent ask questions uh, sub page uh, to the to the manual web page, and we hope we will be able to do it very very soon. But uh, as we have few minutes, I would suggest that uh, we will try to address some uh, burning questions that were raised by the colleagues. I would like uh, to address. I would like to raise these questions to our panelists. First of all, uh, uh, there were the questions about. Uh, uh, needs to clarify what is the differences between decision limits and uh, um, just a moment decision limits and um, uh, uh, reference references. So probably we can address this question first. And then there were a set of the questions um, related to the just a moment, uh, for example, about uh, association relation between uh, human semen and age, uh, duration of abstinence uh, before collection of the sample, association with smoking, alcohol, etc. cetera, uh, the, as a risk factor, so as factors. In, 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 so I would like to um, invite on panelists to address who would like to start first and reflect on this question. The second question. So yeah. probably the first question is about differences between uh, uh, limits. Lars can answer. Yeah. Nice. I can answer that question. And to try to make it very short, a reference limit is based on data from a reference population. And it only defines the distribution of results from that reference population, it, it is mainly useful if the population is well defined. A decision limit takes it from another point of view. So we could say an example about which limit will we, so to say, never find men with hypogonadism, or under which level are we likely to find those men who have an endocrine problem? Under which limit will we will it be possible to find karyotype abnormalities? Under which limit will we find Y chromosome micro deletions? So that is the decision limit. The reference limit is based on the reference population data. I hope that answers. Thank you very much indeed, Lars. Uh, whether uh, other panelists would like to reflect on this or we can try to answer a few additional questions about the effect of age or duration of abstinence before collection of sample probably the duration of abstinence before collection of sample. Uh, any reflection on that? Lars? Yeah. Uh, one, I saw the question, and the question was if the age of the patient should be in the report, but I would say that should be in the, because the, the birth date of the patient should be in the report. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the abstinence time is also important, and I would say it's the most practical time to record. Many patients can perhaps, many men can remember the last time they had an ejaculation, but it's more about do they have, does this man have a frequent ejaculations or he was a tool to have three days abstinence time before this sample and then they had three months before that. <laughs> that will actually affect the samples too, but it's not practical to have uh, men to have a diary and pick in every time they ejaculate. That would be very disrespectful, but I agree. And that is also suggested that that should be in the report form. How many days since the last, uh, since the most previous ejaculation? 
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lars. In terms of saving our time, I would suggest that other questions, because they were really quite uh, often asked during the webinar, and we received the similar questions before, that we will try to formulate our answers in the frequent uh, asked questions. And we will consult it with the editorial board of the sixth edition and other technical partners who are working with us on this uh, project on this manual. So um, by having said this, I would like uh, once again to uh, reiterate and uh, confirm that this webinar is recorded and will be made available on the WHO web page. We hope it will be done very soon because we received some questions about the availability of this webinar being recorded. As well, uh, I would like uh, uh, to project our um, final slide. Yes, so the manual itself, because we received the questions about where the manual can be accessed. So this is the web link to the sixth edition of the manual. You can just use the proposed link or using QR code that you see on the slide. And uh, through this, you can access the sixth edition of the manual, two versions available. It's online version, which is slightly different in terms of how to use from the PDF version, because if you would like to have the printed version, you can also access the PDF version and print this document. Um, uh, so it's just regarding these questions. And uh, finally, I have a great pleasure to thank uh, our distinguished panelists for the fantastic, uh, very uh, comprehensive, clear uh, presentations and talk um, uh, about the topic of our webinar, about the role of this manual in the field of the sexual and reproductive health, and particularly about the sixth edition of the manual, which is now in life available. I would like to thank all colleagues from WHO who supported uh, and helped us with the setting up this webinar and the preparatory work for the launch of the manual uh, through different channels. Uh, you probably, if you are using tweet, it was quite intensive tweeting process regarding the manual since uh, earlier today. Um, and of course, all of you, our participants, for your attention, for your question, for your interest in this document. As once again, the document is in life. We really hope that it will be very useful for your daily work, for your clinical work, for your research. So please uh, use our website, look at the updates, and we hope that uh, again, the document will be very, very useful for you. Once again, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, we wish you all the best in your professional and personal life. Stay well and keep safe.